are certainly happy you are here this evening and happy for the honor you show God by being here. We're going to be thinking together mainly from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this evening. And if you would enjoy turning there in your Bibles and following along with us, we'd appreciate that very much. Another most pleasant day. The people who were here for the Bible study this morning represented you very well and they brought great food, which is always sweet. Bill and Rebecca had me over this evening and another excellent meal and a fine visit. Mike let us come out this afternoon and enjoy a fine Bible study with him and I really enjoyed seeing Justin lead that Bible study and learning more about Mike and appreciate those opportunities. Dennis and Sandy knew me in another lifetime way back when and came anyway tonight. And I know you had incentive, but thank you for coming. And Jerry, it was just such a pleasure to uh, meet you yesterday. And then when I got back to Joe and Jan's to hear them talk so highly of your long work and how much you've blessed their family and blessed so many young people in this area for the kingdom. And that's just encouraging to me. I enjoy hearing preachers and elders speak highly of one another and appreciate the fact that we're able to serve in the kingdom together and that God blesses us with those opportunities. Tomorrow night, if you have a friend who might enjoy thinking about heaven, we're going to think about how the mercies of God move us toward heaven and how wonderful heaven will be. We won't do much in the way of speculation because I'm not that bright and it wouldn't bless you. But we'll read from God's Word and we'll talk about some of the wonderful things God says about heaven and why we want to be there no matter what it might cost and how rich it'll be to take others with us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Tonight we're thinking about mighty mercies of God. I appreciate the way you've thought with us about the fact that we do need to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices wholly acceptable to God because we have seen We've appreciated, we know something about the mercies of God that call us toward Him. You think about the mighty mercies of God. There were brothers, the sons of thunder. And when a village rejected Jesus, their word was, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah and consume them? But one of those brothers became the apostle of love. And Jesus didn't let him bring down the fire. You think about Peter. Peter could put both feet in his mouth at once and speak out of turn in a hurry. And the mercy of God made him a rock, a pillar, a preacher of righteousness. You think about Saul of Tarsus, one who breathed threatening and murder against the way. But the way came to see him. And he learned something about the way, the truth, and the life. And when he turned his life around and obeyed the gospel, now why do you tarry? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. He became a preacher of righteousness who led people into the gospel way. I love the fact that the mercies of God call on us to make such changes. And that God will give us opportunity to grow in those wonderful ways. We're to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices. You know that our bodies are not ours. The Bible teaches that over and over again. So God created man in His image. In the image of God, He created them, male and female. 
In Him we live, move, and have our very being. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You were bought at a price, at a wondrous price. And then you think of 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot, without blemish. I do a little bit of marriage counseling from time to time. And you've heard the story of the gentleman in another culture far, far away where the bride price was a cow. Or if she was really wonderful, a couple of cows. And if she was super stupendous, three cows. And the gentleman went to see father-in-law to talk about the bride price And father-in-law had not the best estimation of his own daughter. And as the story goes, they negotiated a bid and father-in-law was hoping maybe to get two cows for this one cow girl. (laughs) The old boy, the future husband, way brighter than Bill, set a new record for the village when he led seven cows in to gift the family for his bride. Best bride ever. Happiest bride ever. Seven cow woman. In God's eyes, all of us are seven cow souls. He loves us that much. You were bought at a price Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I love to think from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 because we really go all the way back to verse 9 and we read a little bit of bad news before we read wonderful news about the mercies of God. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Alone, that would be super stout. It's true, and it is stout. There are behaviors which disqualify people from the kingdom of God. And anybody who chooses to walk in rebellion has made an awful spiritual choice. But the good news, verse 11, such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Aren't you happy that no sin is beyond the forgiveness of God? Aren't you happy that no past is too dark for God to look at? Aren't you glad that God loves every soul more than we can even imagine, no matter what the embarrassment or the cost or the headline or the jail time or the debt, the blood of Jesus Christ, the mercy of God, can wash that sin away. We don't have to be soft on sin. If we were soft on sin, calling evil good, We would be dishonest before God. We need to tell the truth, and the truth needs to start with me. I need to hold up that mirror of God's Word. One of the amazing things about this sin list here, oh, some of those smell worse to us. Some look worse to us. Some might have more ramifications even on this planet, but all of them will separate between God and a soul. 
But none of them can separate between God and a soul when there is genuine repentance, a change of heart and direction. When there's genuine rebirth, being washed in the blood of the Lamb, born of water and the Spirit, made new in heart and mind and soul. I love the mercies of God. One of the things I want to remember about this list, it's a good list, an honest list, a stout list. It's not an exhaustive list. It's representative. And we read it in light of the rest of Scripture and we appreciate the fact that if we want to see God one day, we must be in Christ. And we must walk in the light as He is in the light. I love the fact that God invites us through His mercy and His truth to take care of our bodies. You know that great truth from Deuteronomy 10? The fact that God gives commandments to His people for our own good has always been true. Justin, I do not like the fact that sometimes in marriage counseling we will try to help people turn from the sin of adultery and rebuild their marriage. But as a counselor now to be ethical, I have to say to people when there's been adultery, you have made the required doctor visit to be sure you're physically okay and that you're not going to kill people in your own home, haven't you? And sometimes they'll look at me like I've shot them. No. I just want to be fair and ethical. I can only work with the living. And when we do that, people seem sometimes to be shaken a bit. I'm here now working on this. Surely God would not let some disease or HIV or whatever come in. Oh my. God gives us wondrous guidance for our own good. And when we step out of that guidance and do things in a rebellious manner, we open the door to Satan maybe way more broadly than we ever imagined. But you know there's something else I need to remember from this list. I am just as much in need of the mercy of God as anybody else. When God looks at our lives, God will see the covetousness or He'll see the dishonesty or He'll see the sins of the tongue and He will judge those just as fairly and rightly as any other sin. We need to give God heart, soul, mind, and strength. The other thing I love about this part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and such were some of you. You think about Saul of Tarsus. If I were the devil, I would sit on his shoulder and say, you don't really believe God could forgive a person who consented to murder. You don't really believe God could forgive a person who got licensed to hunt down Christians, men and women, and carry them away in chains. But Saul knew better. Paul knew better. He was what he was, but he wasn't stuck there. He had the same capability we all have to hear the gospel, to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, to turn from sin and confess Jesus, to be born again and then to live that new life. We appreciate 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. Paul says there, All things are lawful for me, but... All things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food, but God will destroy both it and them. The body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. 
Do you not know that he who is joined with the harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall be one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Don't you love the fact that the Bible doesn't mince words? Part of the mercy of God is that the Bible will put the truth out in front of us plain, clear, and simple. We live in a time when people want to differentiate intent and behavior. When people want to rationalize and excuse, I don't know that that's a new invention, but it's certainly well practiced in this day and time and practiced to the detriment of so many. The Lord wants us to know. Even a child is known by his deeds, by whether what he does is good and right. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. The devil loves to lie. The devil loves to discourage Every now and then, some good sister or brother in Christ in the latter years of life will say something like this to me. Well, I just don't feel like I've served the kingdom the way I ought to serve the kingdom. And so I start asking questions. You mean you've had a secret life of sin? Oh, oh no, no. What you see is what you get. You mean those children I thought were serving as elders and deacons in the Lord's church, they're not really... Oh yeah, they're doing great. You mean those precious grandchildren who are growing up in the faith and loving the Lord and will one day be Christians? Oh, oh no, they're, they're doing fine. You mean those mission works uh, that you supported, they weren't real? Yeah, they were real. You mean that life you've lived year after year adorning the gospel and inviting people to believe that every word of God's Bible is true? Oh, oh no, no, we still... Then you've done well. I'm not the judge. And they don't have to have my approval. But I love building people up who do right before God for the right reasons. I love encouraging people who are honest and stalwart. Now understand, we need to be a little careful with verse 12. I'm not sure if verse 12 might be a bit of an ellipsis. All things allowed by God are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. I'm not sure. It may be that Paul is there quoting a tagline from some of his critics, and really he's quoting them. We know that Everything is not lawful. There are some things that are illicit, illegal, sinful, and such like. But Paul is talking about things that even are lawful. Even among the things that are lawful, let them be helpful. Let them be kingdom enhancing. Let them be God glorifying. If they need to be in moderation, let them be in moderation. If they need to be with passion, with passion. Oh, what a great teaching. What a strong teaching. I've learned that we preachers are blessed. And you're good to us. I appreciate that. But I also appreciate the fact that you need to go Berean on us on a regular basis. Uh, receive the Word with readiness of mind, but search the Scriptures daily whether those things are so. I don't mean to be rude, but any preacher who tells you, believe me, don't check behind me, watch your wallet and check behind him. Because something bad is about to happen. We need to trust the Lord ultimately and not even ourselves at that level. I love the fact that we're being admonished here as we present our bodies to God as living sacrifices according to the mercy of God, not to go extremist on anything. Every now and then I'll work with a depressed person. There are two things I'm going to encourage that depressed person to do in addition to prayer and worship. One is sunlight exercise. You know, get out there with it if you can. 
And then I have to really watch myself, Justin, because the last time I did this, my person came back in the next week sunburned because they'd been out way too long and sore of muscle because they'd overdone the... Ex and I wasn't talking about two hours a day. I'm thinking about 15 minutes and start it up. Now, this is a freebie. Uh, also, the other thing I'll, I'll do, and, and you can steal this if you want to, I also ask them to do a happy book. There are two rules with a happy book. It can be electronic, journal, composition, back of an envelope. You could even write it on your arm, but it, it would wash off. The two things with a happy book, every day you have to make an entry, at least one, and only happy things go into the happy book. Do you know what that does to your mind through the mercy of God? You know now, you've promised the guy, you're going to do the happy book and you're going to make one entry every day and your brain goes to work on that and all of a sudden you start noticing happy things. Now the happy thing may be, uh, yo, Justin is our preacher and this guy will be gone tomorrow. The happy thing may be beautiful children enjoying grandparents and lighting up like Christmas tree when they're here. The happy thing could be a butterfly. It could even be the near miss, as long as you totally miss that wreck. But something, every, God's mercies are all around us. I don't mean for a moment to be whitewashing things and trying to present a Pollyanna version of the world. You're too bright for that. And the Bible is too honest for that. But the truth of the matter is, if we'll have eyes to see them, there are multiple blessings and joys and gifts every day that will overcome those struggles and those battles. You know, we've been washed. We've been sanctified. We've been justified. One fellow put it like this, God can do what we can't. We can wash the body, but God can wash the soul. We can seek forgiveness, but God can forgive and forget. We can seek to restore purity, but God can make us pure, blameless, spotless, right before His eyes. I love this passage. Love these great teachings. I love the fact, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. My friends who read Greek a lot better than I do remind me that Throughout the Corinthian letter, sometimes we're talking to individual Christians and sometimes we're talking to the whole church. I can appreciate that. I buy that. But one of the things I also enjoy doing on my simple level is remembering, you know, whatever I want the church to be, I need to be. Whatever standard I believe you should live up to from Scripture, I need to live up to. And just as surely as I need to police myself and take care of me, I also need to help you take care of you and I want you to help take care of me. I probably should have mentioned this on Sunday. You would have had occasion to practice by now. Whether it's at Mars Hill Church or at Heritage Christian where I work, anybody on campus who finds Bill with something stuck on his teeth is free to say so. I'd love to fix it. Anytime the, tie, the knot on the tie is not right, free to fix it or to point me to the nearest mirror. About a third of the time I forget to button the little buttons on the side and Laura hates that so you're welcome to say that as well. And if my tie sticks out the back, you know my mirror doesn't work so well and my arms won't always get back there to fold that collar down, I have people on campus who will fix that for me all the time and I've just learned to say thank you. Now they think I'm overly concerned with appearance, but you can look at me and tell I'm not overly concerned with appearance. What I'm overly concerned with is attitude. I want to be sure, because of the mercies of God, 
that I try to stay correctable, that I try to stay appreciative of people who want to help me. What a fine quality. It's a quality of mercy. It's a quality of family where we help and we bless one another. And you may be wondering, well, okay, you've given all this attention to these sins and that sad list from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 6 through 9. Isn't there something else that ought to be added here for us to think about as we present our bodies to God, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to the Lord? Let's visit for just a moment with James chapter 3. Especially James chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive the stricter judgment we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. You appreciate this teaching. We put bits in the mouths of horses. And if they're tough enough, we'll put a cutter bit in. We use rudders to guide the ship. And that tiny rudder will guide the ship. On the negative side of things, you don't have to go to California or to Colorado to know that one match or one lightning strike can start a fire that will burn homes and animals and habitat and acre after acre after acre. We all stumble in many things, but that doesn't make stumbling right. And as surely as God wants us to give ourselves to Him as living sacrifices. He wants us to give our tongues to Him. Have you ever seen little kids play soccer or run competitively? Some of them are naturally type A go-getter. They'll do it. Others of them, if you're there to see... And if you speak up, you can see the energy coming to them. You can see their response, how they step up and move to a different level. I don't want to pick at you too much, but you make a preacher want to preach overtime because you listen so well. And then you're kind as we go out the door. You find something sweet to say or you don't say. Either way is cool. And it makes preacher feel appreciated. You get an opportunity in Bible class to speak up and help teach and you do that and everybody loves it. Oh, just in that class you led today around the table, just as fine as could be, that would be an excellent class anywhere, anytime. Don't you love the fact that God has given us the ability to not only teach His Word but also to reinforce that teaching through our encouragement, through our sweet words. We get to choose that path. I know like you do, that it's pretty important that God put the tongue in there, tied it down on one end, and surrounded it by teeth. I understand that there's a degree of wisdom in the fact that there's one tied down tongue and there are two ears. I appreciate the fact that most of us, even on a bad day, we can look really bright if we're willing to listen a bit and speak a kind word thereafter. I've always loved Colossians 4 and verse 6. I believe with all my heart it's another mercy verse. Let your speech... Always be with grace, seasoned with salt. We recently had a speaker in for a fundraising thing. Innocuous, no harm. But the speaker could only come on a Wednesday evening. We got this set of emails from some extremely angry brethren saying, why have you chosen to compete with the Lord's church and deny people the opportunity to attend Bible class? 
And I was a little miffed because I knew the rest of the story. I didn't miss Bible class either. Uh, the rest of the story is there was a Bible class 45 minutes ahead of that speaker. And everybody who attended got an opportunity to participate if they were willing. And we'd never do anything that wanted to compete with the Lord's church or rob people of an opportunity to study. I sent back an email to that effect. Nice. Short. And in a few minutes, problem solved and no more criticism. Don't you love the fact that the mercy of God gives us the ability to think before we speak? And the mercy of God gives us an opportunity to say to ourselves, how do I practice the golden rule in this situation? Even if correction or rebuke is needed, nothing wrong with biblical correction and rebuke. Very much right. How do I do it? In a spirit of gentleness, considering self, lest I also be tempted. What a blessing to give ourselves to God. Not only our bodies, our tongues, our minds, and our hearts. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, your reasonable worship. It's right, it's sound, it's biblical, it is solid. You know what that does to people over a lifetime? I know you do. Because some of you have already done that over the bulk of decades. Have you noticed how sweet that makes people? How kind, how radiant, how appealing. I think back to my youth. In my youth, the little place where we worshipped, they were wonderful people, but some of them were too tightly wrapped. And I'm not insulting them. They were very concerned because the little congregation had finally achieved enough solvency that they thought they could afford a water fountain. And they wanted to put it in the back of the building, Justin. And because some of our brethren were a little careful, I'm afraid too careful, they just thought this would be a horrible thing. And I was sitting in a business meeting of men as a kid wondering how is the Lord going to rescue this situation? And I'm not even thinking about the mercies of God and sacrifice and people way smarter than Bill. But until I die, I'll never forget Horace Holly. Well, the holly was short of stature, huge of heart. He listened while some younger, somewhat poorly thinking people argued a little, raised his hand, got the floor and said, Brethren, my wife and I have a little money extra we'd like to give to the church. Would it offend any of you if we paid for that water fountain? And so one of the other guys who'd been a little hot said, uh, wasn't hot anymore. If you'll pay for it, I'll put it in, no charge. Any objection? Problem solved. Sweet. I think about mercies of God, kindness of God, sweetness of spirit, willingness to give, there was nothing huge about that event except that the devil didn't win. And to my dying day, I've got an example there of if it's all right with the Lord, it's all right for us to sacrifice a little extra and give a little extra and bless a little extra and encourage a little extra. Because God is always that good. 
One last thing. The last time I did this lesson, a fellow basically said to me after the lesson, Bill, I would love to obey the gospel, and I believe the verses you read, but I'm just absolutely not sure I can clean up my act that fully. I'm not sure I can live up to that call from James 3 or 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I admire the gentleman's humility. But I finally, after all these years, learned what to say to him. You can't. Not by yourself. You can't. Not on your own willpower. You can't because you're that bright or that strong. But you can with God. And you can with brethren. Because that's one of the richest parts of the mercy of God. He'll let us take care of one another. And He'll give us space to grow. If tonight you need to put on the Lord in baptism or tonight you need the prayers of brethren, let us know. The mercies of God await, even now, as we stand and sing.